it's important to look at the background to disinformation or and other issues because this is playing a key role at the moment. First of all, we have Mr. Taras Kuzio, who is Professor of Political Science and current research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society in London. Then we have Ms. Ludmilia Pitkumekuya, I hope that I have pronounced that correctly, Associate Professor at the National University of Kiev Mola Academy, and Ms. Emilia Kustova, representative of Memorial International, the organization pursued by the Russian authorities, and Associate Professor of Russian History at the University of Strasbourg. We will also hear from Ms. Martina Bilchukievich, who is head of the East Stratcom Task Force at the EEAS. We will also hear from her afterwards. But first of all, Mr. Kuzio, you have the floor for seven minutes. Yes, hello. Um, I've, I'm assuming you, you can hear me. Um, I'm going to really give the background to understanding why Vladimir Putin is obsessed with Ukraine, why he launched an invasion of Ukraine that has led to this European and global crisis. Um, and I place the emphasis here on the stagnation of nationalism in Russia during Putin's presidency, um, back to what I would call the pre-Soviet understanding of the three Eastern Slavs. Here I mean that Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians are three branches of what was then used to be called a pan-Russian nation, an obshiruski narod. So this is a, um, a rejection of the Soviet recognition of a separate Ukraine and a separate Ukrainian people. This is going back to um, late 19th, early 20th century and what was prevalent amongst white Russian emigres. This is nothing new. It's, it's something new for some reason amongst Western policymakers and Western academics, but Vladimir Putin has been denying the existence of Ukraine and Ukrainians since at least 2008. And he has been making territorial claims for, for the same period of time. And the um, link to this is, is, a, is a perception that the, the natural state of Ukraine, what Ukraine should look like in the eyes of Russian leaders, is a country resembling Belarus under, under self-declared President Alexander Lukashenko. So the, the goal of, for example, Putin's goals of demilitarization, denazification, are to transform Ukraine into a second Belarus. That is the ultimate goal. Whether it's realistic is a separate debatable question, but that's his goal. Um, and he really does, and they really did believe, and um, for many, many years in Moscow, they have believed that, that the majority of Ukrainians want to be part of the Russian world, want to be a part of the Russian sphere of influence, but they have been denied that right by, the, by nationalists who came to power in the Euromaidan revolution, who have made Ukraine into a U.S. puppet state. And that is an important way of understanding how, the, how Moscow sees this crisis. It sees, um, sees Ukraine as a place that um, has been unnaturally pulled away from Russia. Most Russians have always had difficulty in, in accepting an independent Ukraine. This has been true for the last three decades. And especially a Ukraine which is outside of the Russian sphere of influence, i.e. integrating into Europe, NATO, EU. So what do they mean by denazification? Denazification means the destruction of Ukrainian national identity, which was cultivated during three decades of nation building. So the transformation of Ukraine into a, like a little Russia, as a, a a branch of that pan-Russian nation. 
the installation, the replacement of Volodymyr Zelensky with a pro-Russian puppet dictator, um, similar to Lukashenko. Um, that would mean, and the U.S. intelligence has leaked this many weeks ago, a kill list. Uh, Ukrainian politicians, Ukrainian civil society activists, academics, uh, journalists who are who support a pro-Ukraine identity, who supported the Euromaidan revolution, who support a pro-Western orientation, are to be imprisoned and potentially executed. And that those developments are already happening and beginning in areas of southern Ukraine under Russian occupation. Um, Putin's goal is to, and he said this on many occasions, including back to his famous essay in July of last year, to um, get rid of this anti-Russia Ukraine. That's how he sees it. He sees the nationalists and the United States, EU, of having created this anti-Russia in Ukraine, and that has to be replaced by this little Russia. Um, that could be also linked to potentially dis dismembering Ukraine with, uh, with southern eastern Ukraine being more closely integrated into something that Putin revived in 2014, this so-called New Russia. Um, Vladimir Putin and Russian leaders have said on many occasions that Soviet leaders were wrong to include southern and eastern Ukraine within the Ukrainian state. Um, denazification, once that is implemented, is supposed to then lead to demilitarization, which would be the creation of this so-called neutral state, um, which would no longer seek NATO membership. But it's not just NATO. It would be no longer seeking also EU membership. Because remember back in 2013-14, Russia applied intense pressure on uh, President Yanukovych to reject the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement and to then turn Ukraine eastwards towards joining the Eurasian Economic Union. Putin wants to see Ukraine, Kiev, the so-called mother of Russian cities, as part of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, and the Russian world as the core central three countries of the Eurasian Economic Union. And without Ukraine, that in, in Putin's eyes, that's wrong. Putin sees himself as this, and he wants to see himself going into Russian history as the gatherer of Russian lands. Crimea 2014, Belarus 2020, and Ukraine now. So this, this entire uh, criminal invasion is all linked to um, a imperial nationalism that really is completely out of place in a, in a postmodern uh, European um, Union. Why, ha why, the, why did the invasion begin now? Well, I believe that um, there are many factors, and I list them in one of these slides. But in particular, um, the Russian uh, Vladimir Putin has been increasingly isolated in the last few years. He's, he's become increasingly obsessed with Ukraine, reading this emigre and Russian nationalist literature. You saw that in his long essay published last year. Um, President Zelensky um, uh, organized criminal charges of treason against Vladimir Putin's representative in Ukraine, Viktor Medvedchuk. Four pro-Russian television channels were banned. Putin takes all of these actions as very personal. Um, I think another another red line for Putin was the launch of the Crimean platform in August of last year to raise international publicity about Crimea. And then also in October, Ukraine began using Turkish-made drones to uh, counterattack um, when, when there was uh, enemy fire on its positions in the Donbass. So I think a combination of those, plus I think in the Kremlin, in Putin, they believed that using the Minsk agreements and um, small level, high, low cost, low level military pressure in the Donbass had failed to achieve Russia's goals. And Russia's goals were always not compromise, but Ukraine to capitulate 
and become this second Belarus. So hence, the, the, the artificial crisis began in November of last year. And it was a completely artificial crisis because Ukraine was n never going to be given the NATO membership at the time. There was no U.S. missiles going to Ukraine, and Ukraine had been cooperating militarily with NATO for 30 years. So nothing new had happened except in Putin's change and evolution. This is a different Putin, a more dictatorial Putin, compared to 2014. And I think there's a strong interconnection between, between domestic repression in Russia since the changing of the constitution in 2020 and um, the move towards a dictatorship in Russia and external aggression. They're closely connected between the two. Vladimir Putin has completely miscalculated in this crisis. He's miscalculated in three ways. Firstly, with the Russian people. This is not going to be a popular war in Russia. This is not the same as in 2014, which was popular. I think your previous speakers um, are being a bit too liberal on this question, um, unfortunately. Um, support in Russia for the occupation of Crimea has remained steady over the last eight years at 85% support. Even opposition leader Alexei Navalny supports the occupation of Crimea. So let's not have illusions about this. But Russia's invasion today will not generate that same mobilization of Russian nationalism as the Crimea, because the Crimea is, has a very special link to Russian national identity. So that's one thing um, in, in Russia. And of course, the impact of the Western sanctions um, is another miscalculation. Vladimir Putin expected, and Russian leaders expected, that the West would be divided, the West would again implement very weak sanctions, as it did in 2014. The sanctions in 2014 were, were I'm sorry to say, quite pathetic in, in response to what happened in Ukraine. Today they are not, but they expected in Moscow that, that the sanctions would be again weak and there would be dissenters in Europe. Remember, after 2008 in Georgia, there were no sanctions. 2014, there were weak sanctions. And now, finally, we have strong sanctions. So they miscalculated again there. They miscalculated in Russia, miscalculated in the West. The third miscalculation was inside Ukraine. Because of, because of this Russian nationalist mythology that Ukrainians don't exist as a separate people, they believed that Russian troops would be seen as liberators, that they would be greeted with flowers. Instead, they were greeted with Turkish drones and Western singers and javelins. And I think that the Russian, there's a shock in the Russian army at the strength of the Ukrainian anger and resistance to this invasion. They simply never expected it to be like this. And you see that uh, on the Ukrainian side, there's high morale, high determination, a lot of anger. On the Russian side, there isn't that high morale. Um, you see this in the dejection amongst Russian soldiers. Putin has um, a, um, a major conundrum now, and I'll, I'll end here. Um, macho men like Vladimir Putin are, find it practically impossible to retreat. How can they say they made a mistake? He's already blaming the, the mistakes in Ukraine. Remember that they expected that Kiev and Ukraine would be occupied and captured within one to two days. It's now third week. And the level of casualties of Russian soldiers is already higher than what the US suffered over eight years in Iraq and over 20 years in Afghanistan. It's, it's, it's practically 60% practically of Soviet casualties in Afghanistan after eight years. So this is very, very bad, and a lot of also equipment lost. So Putin's, Putin's conundrum, things are not going well. Can he retreat? Metro men don't retreat. Can he go forward? That's also problematical um, because Kiev is not Aleppo or, or Grozny. Aleppo and Grozny were less than one million populations. Kiev is four million. So it's a much bigger city to capture, far more problematical. There will be resistance will be very high and Russian troops would suffer tremendous losses. 
Uh, yes, of course, there would be probably a lot of destruction of Kiev uh, from this. Um, but how would this respond back in Russia? How would it look in Russia that the Russian leader is destroying the so-called mother of Russian cities, the, the city that's supposed to be where the three Eastern Slavs were created in Kiev Rus? And if Putin is seen as destroying that, I think that will undermine his legitimacy. So he has a major conundrum what to do, um, that because, um, that, and this is why there doesn't seem to be much real a strategy as to where Russia is going in this conflict, except, except by un, unveiling massive destruction on, on buildings and on, on, on the civilian population. So I will, um, I think, end it on, end it on this question. Um, uh, the, the, the driving factor in all of this war is Putin's personal obsession with taking back what he sees as little Russia, Ukraine. Um, and because of that, um, we have this tremendous tragedy unfolding in, in, in Ukraine and this tremendous tragedy in Europe and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now our next speaker will be Ludmila Pitkui Mukwa. Please, you have the floor. Is she connected? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Pikunmika, you can press on the speak button at the bottom of your page now. Your connection is open. Thank you. Please, can you press the speak button? Yes, I pressed it. Can you hear me? I pressed the speak button. can hear you. It's fine. We can okay. hear you and we can see Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today to outline the main historical myth in the Kremlin propaganda as well as to characterize the main channels and platforms uh, through which these myths have been spread. Uh, in addition, I will indicate how manipulation of history has become one of the instruments for Russia's intervention in Ukraine and served as a pretext for the current war. Um, in the address to the Russians after the Russian Security Council meeting on the February 21st, Vladimir Putin described his version of the history of Ukraine. Um, According to his words, Ukraine was allegedly created by Lenin, who gave it too much autonomy in the Soviet state. By saying that Ukraine had not existed before Putin declared that it was purely Russian territory. Thus, he tried to lay the foundations for a possible large-scale attack, which began on the 24th of February. Many Russians uh, see Ukraine as a uh, little brother, little Russian, as Professor Koza has already mentioned, who must obey the elder or it will be forced to do so. In the meantime, Russia has proclaimed itself a world power. Next slide, please. The ideology of uniqueness of the Russian civilization is, ref is reflected in the national security strategy from the 2nd of July uh, last year and information and psychology sabotage and westernization of culture by the Russian Federation of its cultural sovereignty. Attempts to falsify Russian world history, distort the historical truth and uh, destroy historical memory inside inter-ethnic and interface conflicts, weaken the state forming people have become more frequent. The next slide, please. 
In Vladimir Putin's uh, article on the history unity of Russians and Ukrainians uh, that has been already mentioned uh, today from the 12th of July, the history of Russian-Ukrainian relations is dominated by the claim that Ukrainians are an Asian inseparable part of the triune Russian nation. According to the Kremlin narrative, this community is based on a common history spanning 1,000 years, the language, the Russian ethnic identity, the shared cultural sphere, and the Orthodox religion. The next slide, please. In this presentation, I have distinguished three main manipulative techniques or myths uh, in the Kremlin narration that uh, Ukraina or Ukraine uh, stands for Ukraina, outskirt. Uh, actually, I, I don't want to pay so much attention because this theory has been already um, disproved uh, by Ukrainian as well as by uh, European linguists. The second manipulation is about similarities and common language for all Slavic peoples. Um, Alexei Sh uh, Shakhmatov's theory of the origin of East Slavic languages, according to which all East Slavic peoples, Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, and their languages originate from all Russian unity and all Russian proto-language, became known at the basis uh, of Russian uh, imperial policy, Soviet policy, and actually the current uh, Putin's policy. This theory has been uh, also already disproved by American and Ukrainian linguists. So we can come to the next point, which is the imperial interpretation of Kievan uh, Rus uh, as the cradle of three fraternal peoples, Russian, Ukrainian and Belarusian, uh, which remains a canonical historical scheme in the Russian Federation. This mean has been actively used not only in the aforementioned um, article uh, by Vladimir Putin, but also in his earliest speeches, I assume since 2008, Russian Orthodox Church, media, education, etc. Soviet myth of Russian-Ukrainian so-called fraternal brotherhood that deny Ukrainian right to independence and depict Russians and Ukrainians as one people, Adin Narod, uh, are pervasive in the Putin's article, as well as all Kremlin uh, propaganda. Um, after the Russian Federation started its full-scale war in Ukraine, the Kremlin decided to, just, to justify its actions by resorting to well-known theses and uh, manipulations in the frame of all Russian open lesson defenders uh, of peace for school children that was held on the 3rd of March uh, this year. And actually during this lesson, uh, the teachers spoke about the so-called liberation mission in Ukraine and why it was necessary in order to impose a strong impact on the youngest groups of population. Russia used the narratives you were able uh, to see on that slide. The next slide, please. Another channel for spreading the government's narratives and historical myth to influence not only pupils, but also other strata of society uh, is Kremlin-sponsored media that have been and remain the most powerful tool for Russian propaganda. The idea of the Ukrainian and Russian likeness is a major component, uh, for instance, in the analy analyzed uh, program, Nada Pagavarit, uh, we need to talk, and is realized at the level of all combinations such as Ukrainians are like Russians, the fraternal people, we think alike, one nation, common families, movies, uh, holidays, we are all one, etc. In the aforementioned program, guest, uh, and, uh, guest and the host were discussing love, friendship, relationships, whatever, but did not resort to policies, politics and to the analysis of the causes to, uh, that led to the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, this is uh, in line with the concept of the Kremlin propaganda and Kremlin manipulation techniques that the viewer is given uh, a ready-made and clear idea rather than a possibility to think, analyze you know, for themselves what indeed is unfolding around them. The next slide, please. 
In addition to the media, mass culture also plays an important role in establishing Russia as a superpower and a successor of Kyiv and Rus. The image of Prince Volodymyr, called also Volodymyr the Great, who baptized the Rus, has been actively used recently in the cartoons, fiction films, documentaries, and uh, even games. Some of the examples you are able to see on this slide. Volodymyr the Great was recalled by Putin as the powerful gesture of a timeless superhero who predetermines the oral basis of the cultural civilization and human values that unite the peoples of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Belarus, the end of the quote. And actually, um, there is nothing to say that such concepts as uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus uh, did not exist at that time. Uh, it is uh, worth mentioning that the Russian Federation has been actively constructing monuments to Volodymyr the Great in, the, uh, in recent 10 years. And actually, currently, there are twice as many monuments in Russia than uh, in Ukraine, uh, as far as I, I'm concerned, and as far as counted, uh, 15 against uh, 8. The next slide, please. And actually, the final one. Uh, Timothy Snyder emphasized that the story by Putin's article reveals how ill Russia uh, is in the development of its own uh, national story. Uh, the way that Mr. Putin tells his story, Ukraine is a, a kind of crutch. Belarus is a kind of crutch. Russia is unable to tell its story about itself, so the story he told relies upon other peoples. Thus, uh, the Russian propaganda machine, like its Soviet predecessor, is falsifying historical facts and distorting data in order to demonstrate Ukraine's inferiority, minimize its culture, and distort its language. These narratives are spread through various platforms and channels, as uh, you have noticed, education, mass media, and mass culture. As a result of the Kremlin propaganda, Ukraine is not capable of banking on an independent future and separate development. I would just like to finish with the words uh, of Raimonda Milignite. I hope I pronounced correctly her uh, name, Information and Communication Officer of the East uh, Stratcom, uh, who said, for the Kremlin, history is not something to be studied and remembered, but something to be managed to justify Russia's current actions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this insight you gave us. And now uh, I pass the floor to Emilia Kustova. She's represent, uh, a representative of the Russian uh, organization Memorial International and uh, at the moment professor at the University of Strasbourg. Uh, you remember Memorial is also one of the is one organization who got the uh, Sakharov Prize of the European Parliament. So please, Mrs. Kustova, you have the floor. Please press the speak button. Bonjour, uh, mesdames, monsieur. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. Just wanted uh, uh, to check that you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Alors, uh, avec... oh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the uh, world uh, is discovering the place that history occupies uh, in the official Russian uh, uh, narrative uh, and the uh, extent of its distortion. Uh, these uh, speeches uh, about uh, history uh, have been uh, been constructed over the last few years, uh, at least over 10 years. Uh, the arrival of Putin to power in 2000 was already accompanied by uh, some uh, signs announcing the instrumental instrumentalization of history. And this uh, uh, would be uh, the content of future uh, Russians' uh, novels. And uh, uh, Russia, uh, Putin insisted on the role of history in uh, teaching, in, in, and uh, uh, he promoted uh, at the center of his. Uh, uh, narrative uh, references uh, to uh, the uh, major uh, patriotic uh, war, which is what they call the Second World War still in uh, Russia. 
uh, but uh, for them it started in 1941 rather than 1939. So uh, there were uh, people uh, talking about this uh, and there was a, a fight against the falsification of history in 2009, but uh, uh, the uh, room for maneuver for civil society was still quite uh, broad uh, during the first uh, decade of uh, Putin's uh, rule. After that, uh, the regime had become tougher and uh, laws restricting uh, freedoms uh, were adopted in 2011-2012 and uh, the uh, distortion of history became explicit. Uh, uh, Putin uh, often spoke about uh, Russia's past uh, and its place in society and contemporary society. He declared, for example, at the beginning of 2013 uh, that uh, the main uh, resource of power Uh, and the uh, future of Russia resides in our historical memory. So history becomes a resource just like oil. And this desire uh, to put uh, history at the service uh, of patriotic education and uh, legitimizing a governmental policy in so doing uh, has led to the deployment of a whole range of tools uh, uh, to uh, spread uh, the Russian narrative uh, and to limit uh, the scope uh, of dissenting voices, uh, particularly the voices of memorial. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, served uh, to construct uh, the patriotic narrative. Uh, Uh, commemorations, school books, monuments, museums, traditional things, and others are more innovative. Uh, for example, the creation in 2012 of two institutions presented as being autonomous, uh, uh, although they are not uh, 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 independent, uh, the uh, Russian History uh, Society and the Russian Military History Society, both of them uh, come under uh, uh, strong men of the regime, Nashkin on the one hand and Vladimir Nizhitsky on the other hand. And these institutions uh, play a key role in the instrumentalization of uh, history in Russia. Other tools are, are used, for example, exhibitions uh, which uh, Uh, first show in Moscow and then are reproduced elsewhere. All this uh, serves uh, to introduce a narrative, a vision of uh, a uh, military uh, state uh, uh, power which uh, goes back thousands of years, back to the uh, Russia of Kiev. And uh, at the center of this, or what they value is everything which makes the Russian state strong and powerful, both within the country and on the international stage. Uh, this uh, narrative also condemns any popular movement uh, which may contest it. Of course, uh, the major patriotic war uh, uh, occupies an essential place. It, it already had its place during uh, the uh, Soviet era, but it was uh, uh, weakened a bit during Perestroika and uh, the 90s. Uh, so the idea is to construct uh, a uh, building, uh, uh, an edifice of identity. Uh, so uh, this is why Stalin is often rehabilitated, not systematically, until recently at least, and uh, this is why violence of Stalin's policy is often attenuated. Um, in, in the victory in 1945 uh, is seen as a new beginning uh, with uh, re-establishment of the imperial territory with some exceptions uh, and uh, uh, new legitimacy paid uh, in blood. And uh, the idea is to save a world from fascism and uh, the Russian nature has therefore uh, gained a place amongst the great. It is now definitively uh, in the camp of the forces of good which makes uh, it uh, unacceptable to reevaluate its role during the conflict and any uh, dispute of current policies uh, is uh, dealt with likewise. So uh, this crucial role in the war is used to justify uh, the first attack against Against Ukraine in 2014, and it's happening again now. So it's uh, uh, the main uh, crimes against history are also linked to, to the Ukrainian war. 
uh, that uh, was in the report of the uh, which was published uh, in uh, 2021 uh, of the FIDH and uh, of course we uh, this led to the liquidation of memorial there are certain typologies uh, of measures uh, against freedom uh, for example uh, the collection of information, uh, making it more difficult to gain access to the archives, sir, and uh, also spreading knowledge with censorship and criminalization of certain narratives. Uh, there's also uh, part of the general legal framework, which has become increasingly oppressive since 2012. And also uh, there's what uh, is linked to the history of Memorial itself. Uh, for example, the law on foreign agents adopted in 2012, which made it much more difficult difficult for NGOs to function, including Memorial, uh, which uh, finally led to uh, the uh, splitting up uh, the closure of that NGO. Uh, all these uh, tools are, are obstacles, therefore, for the activities of Memorial and uh, other independent stakeholders uh, in the historical demand. Apart from uh, these uh, general tools uh, which restrict uh, freedom, others have been used on an ad hoc way uh, to do away with any narrative which does not conform to the official one. In 2014, of course, the uh, first attack against Ukraine, it was crucial because it was then that a law was adopted although uh, it was dormant uh, for several years before that, uh, criminalizing the rehabilitation of Nazism and it uses uh, uh, very vague uh, notions uh, which allows uh, you to uh, punish with up to 50 years uh, imprisonment of anything uh, which uh, moves away from the official narrative and which can be designated uh, as spreading information which is knowingly false on the activities of the Soviet Union during the Second World War. So that you can understand that with a war like this, it is no longer possible uh, to truly study the history of the Second World War. And in 2020, amendments to the Constitution uh, were made, uh, which were already uh, mentioned uh, by Professor Cortio. Uh, these amendments uh, uh, postulate uh, that uh, uh, the mission of the Russian Federation is to protect historical truth. And one of the amendments uh, uh, does not allow a minimalizing the heroism of uh, the people. And uh, there again, we think of the Second World War. And uh, the toolbox was completed in 2020. And it was therefore ready to be mobilized to impose a single vision of history, crushing any alternatives uh, and any desire uh, to adopt a professional humanist view on universal Russian history, as has always been done by Memorial, and I hope Memorial will continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, lecture. And uh, before I open the questions, we also have uh, Mrs. Martina Bildukiewicz. Please try and stick to five minutes so people still have the possibility of asking uh, questions, uh, and then we can take some answers as well. Chukiewicz. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see you perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I will try to be brief, especially given uh, that uh, many very important points were uh, raised already. So maybe just an additional perspective from uh, Strategic Communications uh, Task Force. Uh, we deal with uh, program and Russia's disinformation since 2015. Um, and what we see, and actually my colleague Raimonda Miglinaita was quoted already, um, we see that the Kremlin has been trying to manage history for years. Um, the political leadership in Russia uses history as a political instrument to foster legitimacy at home and to frame Russia's international role. And uh, historic revisionism is integrated into Russia's domestic and foreign policy. 
Um, domestically, the goal is mostly to consolidate the nation under the banner of patriotism um, against an external enemy. And here I'm going to use uh, um, quite often one uh, word that is very disturbing for us Europeans, and this is the word Nazi. This has been a prevalent narrative, um, very uh, aggressively pushed by the Kremlin uh, for a few years, uh, but uh, especially right now. I will come back to this. Um, Internationally, uh, Russia aims to create an image of itself as a sole force of resistance against Nazism, both now and throughout history. So anyone questioning the role of the USSR, for example, in World War II and its aftermath is a target of disinformation attacks coming both from the media loyal to the Kremlin and from the official sources. That, by the way, included the European Parliament um, a few years ago when the resolution on the importance of European remembrance for the future of Europe was adopted back in 2019. Uh, we have seen similar narratives pushed by the Kremlin uh, and its media for years, I've said that already. Um, examples would include the case of the illegal annexation in Crimea in 2014 under the pretext of a neo-Nazi coup, which is how pro-Kremlin outlets and the Kremlin administration uh, portrays Maidan. It's how, how they call uh, the Maidan revolution. Um, and those efforts intensified in 2019 and 2020 in line with relevant narratives of World War II, as well as preparation for constitutional changes and presidential elections in Russia. Um, and again, those narratives appeared in the build-up to the war, especially in the last few months. Um, more specifically, when we take a look at the last three months before Putin attacked Ukraine again, we can see that throughout the ecosystem of the Kremlin's media, the number of mentions of the word Nazi grew by 290%. This clearly, clearly shows where this information machine wanted to go to justify the war, to make us, and especially the Russian audience, believe that Nazis rule Ukraine and therefore need to be toppled. This uh, made-up narrative continues also throughout the war, and um, the most gruesome example of last days is Russia's attack on the maternity ward in Mariupol, which was explained, uh, quotation marks here, uh, by Russian authorities and their media as the need to clear the area from neo-Nazis. Nazis. Uh, so basically they lie to our faces and they use those lies to justify violence and murder. Uh, my team in Stratcom Task Force, which is part of the European External Action Service, has been consistently monitoring and analyzing programming and campaigns, uh, including those campaigns of historical revisionism. Uh, in our publicly available uh, database of disinformation cases, which we are um, working on since 2015, we collected a few hundreds of examples of disinformation related to historical revisionism. Um, and we regularly publish products to raise awareness about the Kremlin's attempt uh, of historical revisionism. Uh, I can go into details if, if there are questions uh, or if there is any need for me to go into details. We also share regularly with EU institutions and member states uh, our findings and most importantly we uh, try as much as we can to raise awareness about this issue um, because historical revisionism and lies about history are an inherent part of Russia's disinformation campaigns and we see them very much reflected in the current war again. I will stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, ich glaube, es war sehr wichtig. I think it uh, was very important for us to hear all of uh, these presentations to get a general view of uh, uh, how history can be manipulated uh, and how a uh, manipulating narrative uh, can uh, be uh, used as a justification uh, for war and uh, abuse uh, of uh, uh, human rights. Uh, so I think uh, we've seen this uh, in the past. Uh, we we uh, have to ensure that we don't just see one narrative, uh, but we have to address uh, history from different angles and in a critical way. So now I would like to uh, give uh, the floor to our political groups. Thomas uh, Vankovsky, uh, two minutes. Please stick to the time, because we don't have much time left. 
wszystkim ekspertom. Thank you and I'd like to thank all the experts for having made their presentations. It seems that um, Putin is trying to carve out his place in history by returning Russia to its right status. As Professor Kutsio said, uh, Ukraine is only the beginning of this historical revisionism crusade. And uh, is he going to go further towards Moldavia and Moldova or Georgia? And what can the European institutions do to thwart this propaganda? I also would like to ask um, Mrs. Ludmila, you said that to a great extent this propaganda begins at school. Obviously this is um, uh, present in the media and in mass culture, popular culture. What are the chances of accessing independent sources and what are the chances of reducing the impact of Russian propaganda yesterday we heard we saw the brave uh, journalist uh, who rushed on to the stage with uh, with a, a placard saying that this was all fake and um, against the war and what what kind of impact will this have on the consciousness of Russians and I would like to ask all exports about the possible scenarios for the future do you expect Russians to begin to see what's going on or will they go more towards this patriotism, patriotism which was, we just heard about? Herzlichen Dank, herzlichen Dank vor allen Dingen bei den Vortragenden für diese wirklich... Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you <coughs> for these very informative uh, contributions. I think they've illustrated that the narrative, uh, which uh, is uh, at the uh, root of this war, uh, started beforehand. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, this is a, a picture of history and a picture of human beings which has no place uh, in modern times. Uh, it's uh, not about uh, peace, uh, welfare, quality of life, democracy, uh, peaceful living together. It's about uh, uh, territory expansion and it's uh, uh, an interruption of history and the EU is an answer to this. Uh, if uh, I uh, 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 go uh, everywhere in Europe, I, I uh, can come across uh, um, lots of uh, battlegrounds which achieved nothing apart from many deaths. Uh, we, uh, Of course, we've got uh, videos and TV uh, being used uh, to spread the narrative and we have to uh, counter that. And uh, despite uh, our uh, good uh, political uh, education and uh, academic education, there are lots of stereotypes uh, around and even the best education can often not overcome these stereotypes. Uh, and these stereotypes are arising from the war and uh, as has been said already, I think it's important uh, uh, to include the uh, Russian speakers in our countries and inform them uh, th uh, that uh, th 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 so that they can get a uh, uh, a different picture to this uh, official um, narrative. So my uh, questions uh, refer to one aspect which hasn't yet been mentioned, or only briefly, which is religion. Uh, Putin has uh, tried to use orthodoxy in other uh, member states of the EU to, to influence uh, those countries. Uh, and uh, on the Soviet uh, view of history, uh, what about the Hitler-Stalin pact? Is that a, a, a topic uh, uh, being used at the moment? Uh, uh, and also, uh, how um, much in danger are the Baltic uh, countries plus Finland? And another attack uh, issue is that the term Nazis has been used on many occasions. In the Russian Federation, is there any... Uh, anti-Semitic group or groups are, are there far right organizations uh, which use violence and also this uh, picture of uh, uh, neo-Nazis in Ukraine are there any reasons uh, uh, to suspect uh, that that was the case uh, in a recent Ukrainian history? Thank you very much it is important uh, for us to l take a look at our own history. Thank you uh, Renew Bernard Getter Nein? Dann für die ID. Nobody has asked for the floor. Is anybody connected from ID who would like to speak on behalf of uh, that group? Apparently not. Greens, same applies. 
Nobody? Would anybody like to speak on behalf of the Greens? No. Andrei Eslabakov, ECR. Mr. Slavakov, in order to take the floor, you need to activate your camera and your microphone. If you can hear me to do that, you need to go on the upper left corner where you see the gear settings icon. Yes, now you should be able to take the floor. Mr. Slabakov, please press the speak button. Grazie, onorevole presidente. Thank you, Chair. I'm afraid the speaker is just impossible to hear. Vai istinato. I am a little bit surprised by the approach to this discussion. Every time we fight against the propaganda that comes from Russia, we are fighting against the Now, if we are to fight the propaganda and what comes from Russia, we are ready to create propaganda on our own. Do not forget that in any conflict there are two sides. Ukraine and Russia, let us not delude ourselves, are very close, and this is not only due to geography. Three countries there, Belarus, uh, Ukraine and Russia, are looking for Kiev Rus uh, for their historic roots. I am against all types of wars, and I think that this is disgusting because the people who suffer the most are the citizens, the civilians. They are the people who die. The propaganda on behalf of Russia manipulates history in order to achieve political aims and to find a reasonable explanation for such an invasion. I don't believe that we should also uh, turn what is going on into some into a narrative. We know that Ukraine would like to join the Western world. They would like to separate themselves from the former USSR. They want to have a future in the Western European area. But at the same time, they should not denote their past. I will finish with the words of an Italian journalist, if I heard rightly, Fawaci. And I will switch to Italian. What happens in the world? Oh, you can be seen from three points of view. Mine, yours, and the truth. Leider ist die Verbindung unterbrochen worden. Ich... Connections are broken, unfortunately, so I'll give the floor to Mr. Getter. Sorry about this uh, confusion just now, but let me try and underscore an important point. So all these analyses of um, historical revisionism should not allow us to believe that these activities um, concern only uh, 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 don't, don't concern the majority only a minority not even a strong minority Let's just have a look at a few points. Why is it that Mr. Putin has banned the word war? It's illegal to say the word war. I mean, it's a bit odd, isn't it? I mean, he said, look, there was a drugged Nazi in power in Kiev. So it's not uh, illegitimate to launch a war against a, a drug addict Nazi who happens to be in power in uh, in Kiev. Now, if he 
doesn't introduce the word war, it is because this word is extremely unpopular in Russia today. And then the other thing, a couple of days ago, can't remember exactly when it was, you'll excuse me for this, I think it was on the 8th of March, on International Women's Day, why was it then that he said that uh, conscripts will not be sent to the front, uh, to this war, which is not actually a war in the Ukraine? Well, first of all, it was a lie. We know perfectly well that an, a huge number of conscript were sent out to this front. And why did he take this precaution? Why? Because he's afraid. And quite rightly so. He's quite worried about... The same thing happening now as what happened in Afghanistan when young conscripts were coming back from Afghanistan in body bags. Mr. Putin is perfectly aware of the fact. Well, to be polite, how can I put it? Well, perhaps I won't be polite. Is He's perfectly aware of the fact that the rubbish which he's spewing on Ukraine and on Russia and on the history of these two countries, the utter garbage, is not widely shared in Russia at all. As just in the same way as what, what uh, Mr Zemmour in France utters is not particularly uh, agreed with in that country. And... Let's be, let's be aware of all of this and uh, I would like to express my thanks to the Chair for having, uh, uh, having organised this debate and uh, this exchange of views and have an idea about what is ha going on in the brain of the person who is ruling Russia at the moment but uh, let's not say it's the fault of the Russians themselves. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Milan Sver. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the floor, Madam Chair. Thank you very much to all of the speakers for their presentations. Here in the Culture Committee. I never thought we would speak about war, but today we are witnesses to such a discussion, and this is right. It's right to discuss this, Madam Chair. I'd like to briefly inform you that three Prime Ministers are travelling to Kiev today, Czech Republic, Poland and Slovenia. This is a very courageous act. We hope that the objective of that mission will be achieved. I would like to uh, ask the Professor, do you think that the West has reacted properly and correctly to Putin's threats over the past 14 years? I don't believe they have. I think that the intelligence services have analysed things incorrectly and politicians haven't listened. And thank you very much, Mr. Sfer. The left didn't uh, register a speaker, so I didn't uh, see Mr. Merzi. And then Dominic. Much. First of all, I, will, I would like to make a remark. All this analysis about nationalism historical memory, history teaching as a tool in the hands of nationalist elites is very common for every single nation state. There's nothing unique in Russia about that. We experience this in the different parts of the world and still we're experiencing it today. Very rightly, we see we reference to Eric Zemmour, how much his discourse has in common with the uh, discourse of uh, Putin or, I could say, Turkish President Erdogan or others. 
So, and again, I go back to the found, founders of the EU that they knew nationalism means war. And either we defeat nationalism or we are defeated by nationalism. So, this is first thing to say. Now, I have some uh, questions, short questions. First one goes about, um, about certain um, um, Ivan Ilin, whose grave was transported to Russia by Putin 2005. Uh, from abroad, and he was a well-known Christian fascist adoring Hitler. And I found out that actually Putin is referring to his writings from time to time. Uh, I wanted to know, is really Ilin a kind of uh, philosopher influencing Putin and Putin's ideological formation? Uh, my second question is about the anti-Western dimension of Russian nationalism. nationalism. I think that goes back in history. How strong is anti-Western emotions in, in, in Russia? And my third question would be about the Russian minority in Ukraine. How much their rights are protected democratically in Ukraine or not? Is there unsolved issues such as language or cultural identities? Is Ukraine a multicultural democracy or needs to be one? Thank you. Thank you very much. Dominic Ruiz de Vesa. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta, y gracias. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the experts uh, who've already spoken. And uh, as uh, Bernard Guetta, my friend and colleague, said, uh, I'm delighted that this uh, meeting is being held because historical revisionism is, in some ways, a cultural uh, diversion. It's another weapon in uh, the uh, war chest of uh, President Putin. I would like uh, to uh, avail myself uh, of uh, the presence of our guests uh, to talk about two possible initiatives uh, that we could take on our side, uh, given that, as we have uh, heard, uh, there is official history, uh, which is the only version permitted, a very biased version, as we've seen in Russia. So how can the EU help to develop together with organizations such as Memorial, how can we support uh, European and Russian history uh, with academics and people from Russian civil society? Uh, the project uh, that the French presidency proposed, uh, the Commission on European History, that uh, could be a space for dialogue and uh, collaboration. And we could also suggest uh, uh, you and I are in uh, on the board of the European House. Perhaps uh, uh, the European House of History could also uh, address the topic of historical revisionism given the current circumstances. Thank you very much. I think in this House, on several occasions, we have discussed how to deal with uh, teaching history, even in European states. And I, and I think that uh, in the committee we had a dispute with the Polish Ministry for Education, and this was about history being taught from one perspective. Europe is built on a consensus on presenting different points of view, different perspectives on history. Obviously, the perspective of the victor of a war is different from the country that loses the war, or the countries that were attacked have different perspectives than the attackers. But now, you could say that Rome could attack us because previously everything was Roman, or Charlemagne could uh, have, for example, Germany and France 
together. Now this is obviously all very arbitrary because we have international treaties, international agreements, and this is what should count. What should count is what is we have agreed upon, not about what has happened, what happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's so history has been so varied in Europe, and often the continent reacted more unified in the past than we have done in recent history. So all sides of history need to be taught. We need to also understand the perspective uh, of how, for example, how uh, history teaching is manipulated. And certain narratives are used to spread political propaganda, or in this case, to actually pursue a war. And I think it's very important to look at that. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and experts today for their presentations. I think it really helped us all to learn about the background to the situation. And now, in reverse order, because perhaps we, we won't have uh, interpretation very soon and we'll need to continue working in English, would, would somebody else like to take the floor if I miss somebody? Okay, now then, first of all, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Kustova. And then I give the floor excuse me, Ms. Pid Kuimuka, and then Mr. Kuzio. So, Ms. Kuzdova, you have the floor. Oui, merci. Alors, um... Thank you. So, I'll reply to some of the questions or remarks which have been made. Certainly not all of them. Uh, I think all of these questions are extremely interesting and obviously very complex too, especially regarding all the possible scenarios. But specifically Yin, effectivement, c'est le premier nom qui, qui sort quand on cherche à comprendre les lectures de Vladimir Poutine et les influences euh, qu'il a euh, subies euh, ou qu'il a cherchées euh, depuis une vingtaine d'années. Donc, effectivement, ce, ce philosophe et Yin, euh, philosophe plutôt assez marginal, euh, y compris au sein de euh, l'immigration dite blanche, euh, au philosophe d'extrême droite, il a influencé. Il est, il est lu par Poutine euh, et euh, il est maintenant complètement euh, apparaît comme étant légitime euh, en Russie à tel point que il est cité jusqu'au manuel scolaire, euh, etc. Alors, euh, dimension anti-occidentale euh, fort euh, enfin, de cette propagande et de ce récit. Euh, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, ce sentiment peut être assez fort. Il s'appuie bien sûr sur l'héritage soviétique. Je pense que dans les années euh, 90, on a tous surévalué cette ouverture euh, que beaucoup ont vécu, mais qui n'a pas été cette ouverture vers l'Europe, vers l'Occident, vers le monde, euh, que certains ont partagé, mais qui euh, a été euh, pour d'autres vite compromise par les difficultés socio-économiques. Et ensuite, cette, ce sentiment, ce désarroi et ce sentiment euh, anti-occidental et surtout anti-américain euh, hérité de l'Union soviétique, il a été très fortement euh, alimenté, instrumentalisé, euh, attisé par le discours officiel, surtout depuis euh, donc les années 2010. Euh, euh, je, enfin, ce qui a été dit sur euh, la nécessité d'aider une réflexion et, et un travail historien, ça me semble extrêmement important et il me semble essentiel que ce soit l'Europe euh, qui soutienne collectivement cet effort pour faire avancer la recherche pour, euh, sur euh, l'histoire euh, est-européenne, russe, soviétique, 
euh, européenne globalement, c'est vraiment essentiel. C'est bien sûr un travail euh, qui demande beaucoup de délicatesse puisque, vous l'avez évoqué, il y a beaucoup de points, euh, de, de, de conflits, de, de mémoire et de récits potentiels. Euh, pour moi, la plupart du temps, cette, euh, cette difficulté à construire, à écrire une histoire européenne, ça tient à euh, des héritages de, de discours nationaux parfois nationalistes, qui ne sont pas euh, l'apanage de la seule Russie. Euh, et euh, donc c'est une histoire aussi plurielle qu'il faut qu'on écrive, euh, mais sur une, une base commune. Euh, et enfin, je me permets de réagir euh, au, à, au, à la réflexion de M. Guetta, que je partage, mais en partie. Euh, je suis euh, tout à fait d'accord avec, euh, bien sûr, l'idée qu'on ne peut en aucun cas assimiler la politique de Vladimir Poutine à, euh, la au choix de la société russe et de la population russe. Euh, et je suis tout à fait d'accord euh, avec votre analyse concernant la... Euh, la crainte exprimée par le gouvernement de Vladimir Poutine euh, pour euh, donc de, de, de susciter les réactions similaires à celles qu'avait euh, provoqué la guerre en, en Afghanistan, par exemple. Je pense cependant que, malheureusement, cette vision de l'histoire, peut-être pas dans ses, tr ses traits les plus caricaturaux, euh, mais cette vision euh, finalement très nationaliste de l'histoire, elle est partagée par beaucoup de, euh, de gens en Russie, beaucoup de mes compatriotes. Euh, ceci ne veut pas dire qu'ils sont tous d'accord d'aller euh, sacrifier leur vie ou les vies de leurs enfants euh, sur l'autel de la grande Russie et de la grande histoire russe. Et là-dessus, je vous rejoins parfaitement. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Uh, the next is Ludmila Pitkuimukov. Uh, uh, sorry. Ludmila Pitkuimuka. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I just wanted to say that you really pronounce great uh, my last name. Usually people make really ma many mistakes in that. Um, uh, answering the question how youth um, is able uh, to get information and like not uh, uh, Kremlin propaganda information, actually nowadays uh, we can see that it's a bit difficult because uh, as far as you probably know that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram uh, that are very, very popular among young people uh, are forbidden in Russia and people have no access. Uh, so even uh, uh, criminal liability for spreading so-called fakes against Russian army or saying truth uh, about the war in Ukraine uh, is announced in uh, Russia. So nowadays it's a, a bit tough uh, for uh, school children, for youth to get, in, you know, to get uh, information because most of them is getting that information from uh, social uh, media. Uh, speaking about uh, religion uh, and how important uh, it is uh, for Russia, I guess Professor Kuzo would uh, answer more uh, in details because he is dealing with that topic more than me, but I have mentioned that uh, actually um, uh, there is like increasing of monuments to Volodymyr the Great, who baptized uh, the Rus, and like also this uh, myth about uh, unite Orthodox Church and for all three peoples, Ukrainian and Russians, is also a kind uh, of myth uh, in um, current Russian uh, manip uh, manipulation machine. Um, uh, also, uh, briefly answering like uh, to Andrei Slabakov um, question why uh, Ukrainians uh, like uh, wanna um, go European way? Yes, we said yes to uh, European way in 2013 when the revolution of dignity or Euromaidan started, uh, and why we don't, didn't uh, value our history. I just wanna say that uh, we do not refuse our past. Uh, we are proud of our past. Uh, we just don't want uh, Russia steal our history and steal our past and use it uh, like against it. While preparing this presentation, I read uh, also um, an article by Bernard Henri Lévy, French philosopher, writer, publicist, uh, who wrote, let me quote, Ukraine 
uh, Putin says, has a common history with Russia. But uh, this is the story of colonization under Bolsheviks, anarchists from Odessa were swept away with an, an iron boom. And then there was Stalin, the Holodomor, which killed around six million people. So um, if, if you are talking about common history with Russia, that is our common history uh, with Russia. Uh, also, I would like briefly uh, say about um, state and status of Russian national minority uh, in Ukraine. Unfortunately, uh, there was no census since 2001. And I can't say for sure how many ethnic Russians uh, live in Ukraine, but I can say for sure that uh, very many people speak uh, Russian. They are not ethnic Russians. They just speak Russian because of uh, Bolshevik uh, language policy and Soviet uh, language policy because of Russification. And um, I was dealing a bit with uh, like Russian um, media in uh, Ukraine. Uh, so I just briefly, uh, in 2019, unfortunately, I don't have like, uh, right now um, an appropriate uh, statistics, but in 2019, there were uh, more than 300 papers published uh, in Russian and the uh, number of copies of, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, there uh, were more uh, Ukrainian papers, uh, but uh, the number of copies um, of Ukraine, of Russian um, papers and magazines uh, was higher than uh, even Ukrainian. And also in 2016, um, it was um, the survey Russophone identity in Ukraine in the context of the armed conflict in the east of the country. And uh, there were like focus groups with people from Russian speaking regions of Ukraine, Kharkiv, Kherson and Kyiv, actually those region who, regions who are mostly born uh, right now, and people noted that they are not discriminated against on the grounds of language, and therefore there is no need to preserve or protect uh, the Russian uh, language. And uh, speaking also uh, about uh, the law on um, education and uh, the, about the um, language law, uh, I wanted uh, to say that um, actually. Uh, this laws no way forbids using Russian, Hungarian, Romanian or other languages, but requires Ukrainian citizens to know Ukrainian. And actually, these uh, laws are aimed uh, at protecting minorities and integrate their representatives into Ukrainian society. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, to protect uh, and uh, unite Ukraine. And I would uh, like to say that political, social education education and cultural rights of the national minorities uh, in Ukraine are respected. Uh, unfortunately, there is not so much time to go in details, but there are two articles I have already published on that question, and I, I, they are available in Internet. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for these clear words. Uh, <laughs> and now, uh, Taras Kuzio. Mr. Kuzio, please yeah, can please you press, press the speak button? It's pressed. Okay. Um, I think that is that okay? Fine. We can hear you and we can see you. Uh, okay. I think that there are many good hearted liberal but quite naive people um, listening to this um, regarding attitudes inside Russia. I've already mentioned that in the last eight years, there's been an, a steady 85% um, support for Russia's annexation of Crimea. And it would, be, it would be ridiculous to assume there's no connection between what happened in 2014 and what happened now. In 2014, Vladimir Putin raised the, uh, and he described southeastern Ukraine in Tsarist terms as New Russia. He didn't then invade and occupy the region. Now he's doing that. So there's a direct connection between the two. I think Russian sh people should understand that. Secondly, there is one independent sociological service in Russia called the Levada Center. 
I cite them all the time, and they have found majorities of Russians supporting the uh, separation of occupied Donbass from Ukraine. Only 20% of Russians believe it should remain inside Ukraine. This is before the invasion. A majority of Russians also support issuing passports to uh, Ukrainians living in those occupied areas of Donbass. And also, um, majority of Russians um, support the um, so-called uh, volunteers, in if really nationalist mercenaries, traveling to the region to fight Ukrainian government forces. So we have to be very careful. Yes, it's true that the invasion is never going to be as popular as what happened in 2014 with Crimea. Um, and even people who support the annexation of Crimea, like Alexei Navalny, who does support this, and Alexei Navalny also believes Ukrainians and Russians are one people. Um, but I don't believe that Navalny, if he was president, would invade Ukraine. So you can be a supporter, but not necessarily do what Putin's done. Um, I think that um, where this is going to have an impact inside Russia is the huge number of casualties coming back. What is really unpleasant about the war taking place is that Russian authorities don't care about their casualties. They, they don't try to collect the dead bodies of Russian soldiers. So they are simply left where they have been killed. Um, on the Ukrainian side, that's completely different. I think also when more information comes into Russia about casualties, about what Russian army is doing, destroying uh, property and destroying Ukrainian infrastructure, that will have an impact back home. Um, and not, even though there is control of media, it is impossible to block this information from completely going back to Russia. Just like in the 1980s, it was impossible for the Soviet Union to block information coming back about Soviet casualties. On the question of uh, Russian emigre authors like Ivan Ilyin, Ivan Ilyin was, a, was a, an anti-Semitic fascist white emigre, just like many of the white Russian emigres. But the most important thing uh, on the question of this uh, debate is that um, Ilyin and many similar uh, white Russian emigre writers denied the existence of Ukraine and Belarusians. Um, they believed in the Tsarist view, which Putin also believes, that there is a pan-Russian nation, Ruski Narod, composed of three um, Eastern Slavic peoples. So the coming back, the bringing back of and the reburial of white Russian emigre writers and, and military leaders and the republishing of their works um, obviously has had an, a major impact inside the Russian leadership. Vladimir Putin from 2005 onwards recommends that um, political leaders, governors, regional governors all read Ivan Ilyin. And um, who is, is this fascist and, and anti, anti Semite? On the question of xenophobia, yes, of course, um, there has been a strong level of anti Western xenophobia um, in the Russian leadership since Vladimir Putin's famous speech at the Munich Security Conference in February 2007. And, and the war in Ukraine, in the eyes of Putin and the Kremlin, is a proxy war against the West. As I've already mentioned, um, they believe that Ukraine is a U.S. puppet state, um, and, and which was, and that the the Euromaidan revolution was a uh, was a so-called illegal putsch organized by the e European Union, CIA, etc. Um, and so they believe that they are fighting the West in Ukraine. They're not just fighting Ukrainian nationalists; they're fighting Ukrainian nationalists and the West in Ukraine, and as a goal towards changing the so-called unipolar world to a multipolar world um, and changing the European security architecture. On the question of uh, the Russian minority, we have to be careful here because it's a very small minority. Ukraine is the fourth most nationally homogenous country in Europe, despite all the stereotypes about Ukraine being regionally divided. Ukraine has 92% um, of the population declare themselves to be ethnic Ukrainian. Um, and one, one reason here is that many of the uh, mixed families um, which existed in the Soviet Union in 1991, um, where you had Ukrainian-Russian mixed families, many of them have now 
evolved into becoming Ukrainian. It's now uh, more popular to be Ukrainian. Amongst young people, it's practically not 92%, it's 96%. Um, the number of people in Ukraine who are declaring themselves to be ethnic Russian has declined from the Soviet census of 1989 when it was 22% to the Ukrainian census in 2001 when it was 17, and now it's about 6%. And of course, the more there is Russian military aggression against Ukraine, the more that uh, there will be this self-re-identification. -re One final thing on Russian speakers' uh, population. Um, the uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians are patriots of Ukraine. This was true in, 19, in 2014 when Putin's new, new Russia project failed and uh, Russian speakers in, in the South and East supported Ukraine, not Putin, um, not Putin's policies. But, of course, in Moscow, they simply are unable to understand the very concept of Russian-speaking Ukrainian patriotism. For them, uh, Ruski Yazechny, a Russian speaker, means that they should be pro-Putin, pro-Russian world, and want to be part of that sphere of influence. They cannot understand that, no, um, there is a civic identity, and Volodymyr Zelensky is the example of that. He is from the region of Dnipropetrovsk, which is adjacent to the west of the, the Donbass conflict zone. He's a Russian speaker, and he's of Jewish background. And the majority um, and every region of Ukraine voted for him in April 2019, except one. Um, so um, Ukraine has civic nationalism, patriotism, not ethnic nationalism. In fact, I would say in Ukrainian elections, uh, Ukraine has the lowest support for extreme right parties, probably anywhere in Europe. Um, they, they never get any, any, any votes. Um, and, and, and I think on that I, I, will, I will leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I also, even though they are not there anymore, want to say thank you to the interpreters who uh, uh, spent us 10 extra minutes. Um, but um, now I'm, I'm quite happy that many of you still stayed here, even we did not have uh, interpretation anymore, but I think it was important to listen. Uh, uh, and it was a good input we could get. Thank you very much for that to all uh, the speakers we had this afternoon. I think it was an enlightening and very interesting uh, exchange of views we had this afternoon, and uh, I hope you agree that it was worth it to stay half an hour longer than normally planned. Thank you very much. And now I leave you to the evening instead of those who are coordinators, because they have to start uh, nearly immediately with the coordinators meeting. I want just to remind you that on the 25th of April, we will have our next meeting here in Brussels. Thank you very much. And uh, I just interrupt for a few minutes, and then we can start with the coordinators meeting. Thanks. Thank you.